I will now give the floor to Mr Anthony Banbury. Thank you, Madam President. It's uh, very nice to be here, and I apologize for the technical glitches that prevented me from speaking when called upon. Um, it is a, a pleasure to appear before the Security Council to share the latest developments on the Ebola crisis and the response by the United Nations Mission for Ebola Emergency Response. When uh, the Security Council uh, met in September and passed Resolution 2177, almost 5,000 people contracted the Ebola virus that month. And there was a, a rapid acceleration in cases and some very frightening uh, worst case scenario projections about what might happen. While those worst case scenarios have not come true, uh, it is still the case that Ebola is a very serious crisis threatening the entire region and it poses a global threat. A total of eight countries have had Ebola cases uh, within them and many more are threatened today. The countries of the subregion uh, that are at highest risk, according to the World Health Organization, in many cases do not have the capabilities and the systems to respond quickly and effectively in the case of an exportation event to one of those countries of an Ebola case. Even now, while the worst case scenarios did not materialize, there remain parts of Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea where we see increasing caseloads and indeed in some cases rapidly increasing caseloads that are posing both big risks and big challenges. Ebola is also a very complex emergency and it's very difficult to combat. While more than 5,400 people have died, it's certainly the case that uh, in fact, many more than that have actually died. Those are the total reported cases, but we know that the real number is no doubt significantly higher and that many more people are still going to die, people who have not yet become infected, who will become infected and are going to die from this virus. But beyond the human toll, Ebola is having a devastating toll on the social and economic livelihoods of the most affected countries. This is a message I heard repeatedly and quite strongly from the heads of state of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, but also government officials at all levels, down to the prefet or district level, uh, who expressed, even when Ebola was no longer a, a very prevalent disease in their community, the, the after effects uh, of the disease was so widespread in the economies and livelihoods of the, these communities. Um, there are many statistics that can demonstrate the impact of Ebola beyond the, the health impact. The Liberian Minister of Finance recently uh, informed us or reported that while Liberian, the Liberian economy had been projected to grow at 5.9%, it's now project projected to shrink by 0.4%. UNICEF has reported more than 3,300 Ebola orphans. In the three most affected countries, 10,000 schools are closed and more than 2 million children are, who should be in school are now not able to go to school. The World Bank has reported that in Liberia, 46% uh, of the workforce at the time of the outbreak of the Ebola crisis are now unemployed. Almost half of the workforce have lost their jobs since the outbreak began. One of the impacts of all this is that as the virus spreads in countries, the needs of those governments to respond, including the financial needs, are increasing significantly, but government revenues are decreasing. So the, the gap between available means and needs is uh, getting larger on a virtual daily basis. There are many significant operational challenges posed by the Ebola crisis. 
one of the most difficult is uh, the unknown nature of it. The world has never faced a crisis like this before. Those countries haven't, their health systems haven't, their societies haven't, nor has the United Nations. Health experts haven't. So we are obliged to fight this invisible enemy with tools that we are forging just at the same time we are uh, putting them into use. In addition, the governments and countries most affected do not have well-developed systems, whether they're health systems, the surveillance infrastructure, or the, the road infrastructure, the transport infrastructure, the communications infrastructure. Nor did the United Nations or NGO partners have the kind of infrastructure and geographic presence uh, throughout these countries that is now necessary in order to effectively combat this disease. In part because of all these reasons, uh, the Secretary General decided to establish UNMIR uh, following the unanimous passage of Security Council Resolution 2177 and General Assembly Reg Resolution 691. And the attention that the Security Council has paid to the Ebola crisis, I believe, has been extremely important in mobilizing the international political will and resources necessary to effectively combat the disease. In UNMIR's first 30 days of its existence, we were very focused on deploying the necessary capability on the ground. What we are trying to achieve in 30 days in terms of the information collection, uh, analysis, planning, uh, deployment, establishment of operational capability, this is something that would normally be done sequentially for a United Nations mission over a several month period. And we tried to combine it, uh, do it all simultaneously and combine it in a, essentially a 30 day period. And I believe to a very large extent, we were successful at that. We established presence in four countries. We are operational in the three most affected ones. We have the leadership teams in place, and we have the necessary operational capability in place to carry out UNMIR operations. We are additionally uh, deploying more and more staff, not just to the three most affected countries, but to, the, to remote locations in those countries where the disease is increasingly spreading and where, in the end, we must fight the disease. Uh, I, I should pause here. Uh, Madam President, for a minute to talk about the developments today related to Mali. Uh, while I said we're operational in uh, three countries and establish our presence in four, today the Secretary General has instructed on mere following consultations with uh, President uh, Keita of Mali. Uh, the Secretary General has uh, directed us to immediately establish a presence in Mali to support the national efforts to stop the disease where it is now before it spreads further in Mali. Uh, the Secretary General, I believe, is drawing on uh, important lessons from uh, the current crisis and is determined that the United Nations system take rapid and decisive action at an early stage in the crisis to get it under control before it spreads and has the kind of devastating impact that Mali, some of Mali's neighbors are now experiencing. Uh, UNMIR is a unique mission, uh, tailor-made to a unique and unprecedented crisis. It's unique in many ways. It's the first emergency health mission. It's the first UN system-wide mission. It's a crisis management mission at its heart with the singular objective of stopping Ebola. That's the only objective that this mission has. We're also unique because of the way we're structured uh, based on the things we must achieve, like safe burials and case treatment and contact identification and tracing. Um, so we are organized, structured, you know, around our outcomes, the outcomes that we must achieve as opposed to around the inputs that we are offering. We've put in place a comprehensive 30, 60, 90 day plan, 
and an operational plan around the objectives embedded in the 30, 60, 90 day plan. The operational plan is an absolutely necessary precondition for success. We need a plan that is achievable and if achieved will accomplish the identified objectives. That's a, 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 an essential element of good crisis management and one of the values that UNMIR can bring to the, the table. Our, our uh, work in the operational area, the, these outcomes I was just referring to, uh, case identification and safe burials, case uh, uh, treatment, et cetera, are supported by five underlying enabling activities, uh, logistics, information management, which is absolutely essential to accomplishing our operational objectives, um, human resource mobilization, uh, not just, uh, and not for UNMIR, but in terms of contact tracers uh, and uh, social mobilization, et cetera, um, and the payment of workers. It's not that UNMIR will do these activities. Some of them we will do, but most are being carried out by others, by UN agency partners who are working within the UNMIR framework, as well as, of course, uh, the non-governmental organizations that are playing such an important role in bringing this crisis under control. And in this regard, I uh, need to, or I would like to, uh, pay great tribute to Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, with whom I've met on all my trips and benefited greatly from their advice, and I think have done such outstanding work uh, in dealing with the Ebola crisis from its outset in March. Um, the, as the Special Envoy, the Secretary General noted, we are starting to see significant improvements in the crisis response. We have received very encouraging news. We know that the worst case scenarios uh, of exponential growth have not uh, materialized. Uh, the new cases every week are declining or at least stabilizing. And in terms of the response, the latest WHO numbers show that the known cases, uh, or for the known cases, we are achieving 55% of case isolation and 87% of case burials. Those are very significant achievements compared to where we were when the council last met on this subject. However, we are far, far away from ending this crisis. Uh, first of all, those numbers are, appear better than they are because those are uh, case isolation and safe burials of known cases and the real numbers of uh, cases are much higher, so the percentages are going to be much lower. And even while we see important progress in some areas, we see uh, dramatic declines in the situation in some other areas with a rapid acceleration of cases. Uh, Guinea in particular is in uh, facing, I would say, some difficulty. It has not received the attention and resources from the international community that Liberia and Sierra Leone have. And even though the numbers uh, are greater in both Liberia and Sierra Leone, the complexity of the response in Guinea for a variety of reasons related to geographic dispersal and some of the communities there and security considerations, as well as resources from the international community, make the challenges in bringing the crisis in Guinea under control particularly uh, grave. And as a result, UNMIR is paying, uh, I would say, uh, enhanced attention to the, the situation in Guinea uh, and trying to focus additional resources there, even while we try and do everything we can to support the efforts in Liberia and Sierra Leone. One of the uh, important reasons for success that I would like to underline in the areas where progress has been achieved was the one pointed out by Special Envoy Nabarro. Communities themselves taking action, changing their behavior to protect themselves. That has been absolutely essential and the United Nations uh, takes absolutely no credit for the work uh, and the, the, the actions of the communities. But it must be said that another reason we've seen important progress in uh, areas where that has been attained 
is because of the response, a response by governments, response by NGOs, response by the United Nations system. I believe we have been able to prove that the strategy we have adopted when we apply it works, it succeeds. That's very heartening. At the same time, it presents especially large challenges because the, the operational response necessary is very complex. It requires a lot of moving pieces. It is operationally complex. It is resource intensive. It requires a lot of people, uh, infrastructure, assets to do all that is necessary in an area that is facing an Ebola outbreak. This means that in order to achieve the goal that Dr. Nabarro uh, spoke of and that we all share of zero transmission, the last case under treatment, um, is going to require a tremendous increase in the resources on the ground in a dispersed geographic area. Uh, we are not going to be able to succeed based uh, in just the capitals, much less in Accra. Um, I would also like to uh, highlight that we, we, we know uh, not just the strategy that works, but there's some underlying success factors that are necessary. Uh, in addition to the, the plan that I earlier referred to, it's necessary to have strong government leadership and a crisis management structure in place. I'm happy to say that in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, that exists. Uh, the government has taken a leadership role. Uh, there's strong support by UNMIR and other partners uh, for the crisis management structure. Uh, it's working to varying degrees, but it's in place in, in each country. We also need to ensure that there is a coherent, coordinated international response. And again, I think that is getting better and better on a daily basis in each of the three countries, thanks in part to the role that UNMIR has been playing. But it's clear that more must be done to bring this crisis under control, much, much more. Bending the curve was hard, having a declining overall caseload was very hard. Getting it down to zero is going to be much, much harder. Uh, the, the amount of effort and resources and contact tracers and mobility and, and hard work in the remote areas that's going to be necessary to bring it down to zero is going to be very, very significant. There is a long battle ahead of us. One of the grave great challenges that we're facing is the increased geographic dispersion of the disease, which just uh, magnifies or, or uh, significantly expands the requirements of having resources on the ground. This means that in order for us to get ahead of the disease and uh, not react to it, but uh, be able to defeat it where it is, we need not only that greater geographic dispersal of capabilities, but uh, uh, more mobility and a rap rapid response capability with uh, the contact tracers and the health experts and the laboratory capability and the social mobilization and the burial teams and all the infrastructure that goes with that. It's very, very challenging, but will be absolutely uh, necessary. Um, so in, in conclusion, Madam President, uh, I believe we should be uh, very heartened, as uh, Dr. Nabarro said in his remarks, at the progress that has been achieved uh, and uh, the, those responsible for that, especially the governments, uh, the communities, uh, as well as the NGO community, should take great pride in what has been, been achieved. Um, but we are deep in the midst of this Ebola crisis, a very dangerous crisis that poses today and will pose tomorrow a very serious threat to the, the people, the societies, the communities, the countries that are now affected, as well as other countries throughout the world. As long as Ebola is present and spreading in one country, we know it's a danger to all countries. This is a unique challenge. Uh, the attention of the Security Council is deeply welcome. And right now, we must uh, work hard 
we must work fast, we must uh, work smart, and we must work until the disease is finished. Thank you very much, Madam President. I thank Mr. Banbury for his timely and comprehensive briefing.